uh, Matt is going to turn, which is uh, new. <laughs> and uh, the, the question is, who rules? With all my mind, who rules? And I began to look up that word rule there in the Bible. And the first place I saw it was in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. That word rule is found 27 times. It's the Hebrew word rada. It means to reign or to have dominion, to rule, to dominate. And so the first occurrence is found in the book of Genesis. It's Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it's described how mankind is made. How we're made. And it goes on to show how we use this power. Right? If, you, if you think about it, humans are very creative. Just think about this last hundred years. How technology's changed. You know, we went from flying a plane to going to the moon. You know, some of the stuff you know, I used to watch just seemed like sci-fi. You know, with cartoons like the Jetsons or Dick Tracy there with the with the watch. You know, now we got iPhone watches and microwaves to heat up our food. We've got dishwashers to clean our dishes for us. We've got little robots that go around and vacuum the carpets. And that's all in what, like a hundred years. Just think, man's progress. We've got this power, we've got this ingenuity, we've got this creativity. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it shows us how we're made, and it shows us how we are to yield this power. First, we see there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, if you have your Bibles, we see how mankind is made. It says there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let us make mankind in our image. In our likeness, the Imago Dei, we are made in the image of God. Do you see that? How mankind is made? Mankind. And we as humans, our own species, our own classification, Homo sapiens is the designation given to humans by the School of Science. Coined by Carl Linnaeus in the 18th century. He came up with this title to describe our species, Homo sapiens. You know, I was kind of uh, taken back when I learned what that word Homo sapiens means. Get this, Homo sapiens means wise man or knowledgeable man. It's Latin. Sometimes now I kind of see if we then do a regress there from the 18th century as from a wise man or knowledgeable man to a... This designation was most likely given by mankind's ability to survive and to adapt, to solve complex problems. It's also observed that the more ridges, if you take the brain out of the skull, if you look at the brain, it said that more ridges in the brain, the more ridges that it has, the more complexity and ability to store and process information. The human brain is higher than all the rest of creation in this regard. Humans are considered to be the most intelligent living organisms on earth. Humans have the ability to think and react to situations, whereas animals do not. The human brain is considered large compared to the animal brain. Human beings possess a capability far beyond animals. Both science, those who describe themselves as evolutionists, and religion agree that there is something about mankind that differs from animals. Each offers explanations, certain that the other side is wrong. Humans are given a mind. It has shown the uniqueness of our species. And it has come to baffle and bewilder many who ask the question, what is the human mind? 
And how does it relate to the brain? What separates it and sets apart mankind from the beast? You know, sometimes I look on the news and I read the headlines and I say, is that that person acted more like a beast than a human? What separates and sets apart mankind from the beast? These questions have been linked with what is known as the mind-body problem, which have frustrated many materialists. It distinguished between the brain and the mind. It has been recognized that the physical characteristics of the human brain do not warrant the extreme creative and processing power that defines human ingenuity. The answer is either physical or spiritual in nature. It can be explained in no other ways. And I would like for us today to look at us as unique. Oh, we're so unique. Genesis 1 verse 26 describes it. But I want to go a little bit deeper today about our uniqueness. Consider just a few of the qualities mankind possesses that are unique among all living creatures. Many attributes are so common and assumed that few give them much thought. Yet it should be clear how special human beings are. You know today that you are special. Don't let everybody, anybody ever tell you that you're not. God created you that way. Ask yourself, why does mankind have so many distinctive characteristics? The first I would like for us to look at this morning is humor. Humor. No other creature is able to appreciate create and express humor. Not only does it require creativity, but humor also requires the ability to detach oneself from one's surroundings, to see the odds for real or ironic. And how good it is. When somebody can lighten the situation around you, do you have some of those folks around you? They're smiling, they're sense of humor. It's unique. It's unique. You know, my dad used to tell me that God's got a sense of humor. He talked about the belly button and monkeys and all these things. God's got a sense of humor, you think? Another thing that makes humans unique is the appreciation of beauty. Mankind is able to appreciate all kinds of beauty. This can be as simple as a sunset, a work of art, or the intricate designs of a flower. For example, take someone to see New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art, and he or she will likely feel emotionally moved by the seemingly limitless number of paintings and sculptures on display dating hundreds of years. Take a doll to the same museum, and it will be more excited about the trip and seeing the crowd of art lovers than anything else. This also makes humans unique, the appreciation of beauty. Another thing that's unique to humans is self-consciousness. Beyond the simple recognition of self as seen in a few animals, mankind can step back and become a spectator, critic or admirer of the world around him or her. He or she is able to see his or her place in the greater picture and analyze what needs to be done to affect his or her role. Another thing that makes humans unique is awareness of death. An awareness of death. While animals have a survival instinct, mankind is able to consider that he or she will one day die. Aware that his or her days will not last forever, he or she has a deep respect of his or her mortality. In fact, nearly all cultures perform some form of funeral ritual. This is not found in the animal world. Another characteristic is the understanding of time. 
Animals are only able to relate time to themselves. They have no ability of relating time to third parties. Humans can wonder, speculate, and search the annals of history for lessons and apply those lessons to goals far into the future. Another characteristic that's unique to humans is connections between words. While animals can understand simple words or tones, they do not understand syntax or communicate in complex sentences. Human beings have created hundreds of languages and thousands of dialects even though they are born without any way in which to communicate. Another characteristic that is unique to humans is the meaning of life. The simple act of asking about life's meaning and purpose makes mankind unique. No animal contemplates its reason for living, nor would it be willing to live or die for specific values and ideals. Another attribute is Malleability. Humanity is able to adapt to its surroundings. We wear clothes, build shelters, or modify our environment to suit our needs. Another attribute is the lack of harmony with nature. You know, when left to its own devices, nature will reach balance and harmony. Only mankind disrupts that natural balance with deforestation, changing the course of rivers, pollution, and overmining for resources, and in other ways. We also have a sense of morality. Animals always take the path of least resistance. They do not have a conscience or a sense of right and wrong. On the other hand, mankind will go so far as to control his thoughts based on what he or she considers right or wrong. Another attribute is character. This is the ability to know right from wrong and to turn from wrong and do what is right, even in the face of pressures and temptations. Desire to build character is only found in mankind. We also have free moral agency. Unlike the animals, mankind can deviate from his course of thinking living however he sees fit. Animals react through instinct, through programming. We also have the capacity for wisdom. Without the ability to place ourselves in time, or the animals in time, animals are unable to weigh situations with previous experiences. While animals are able to develop behavioral patterns based on positive or negative stimulation, they are completely unable to analyze actions before they are performed. This ability known as wisdom is unique to human beings. We also have the desire for worship. No matter what part of the world or culture, mankind exhibits a desire to seek, follow, and worship a higher power. Animals do not. And lastly, we are unique because we have the capacity to love. While some animals form lifelong relationships for the purpose of reproduction, none exhibit a parallel with the human characteristic of love, in which a couple shares experiences, goals, dreams, hopes, and aspirations. See, the mind-body problem is a towering issue, one that dramatically separates us from the animal world. And there must be a reason for why the human mind is different from the animal brain. Does science have an answer? What does evolutionists say on the matter? Do they weigh in on the discourse? The mind is one subject most evolutionists will not engage. Simply put, the physical differences between the human brain and that of animals are insufficient to explain the horsepower that has just been described. Three aspects of the human brain demonstrate this point. One is weight. Human beings do not have the heaviest brain and overall weight, or even weight in proportion to their bodies. Secondly is anatomy. Correlations differ between man's brain and that of animals. The third is the cerebral cortex. The nerve center of the human brain is only slightly 
more complex than that of animals. No physiological explanations exist for mankind's mind. Biologists have no irrefutable evolutionary evidence. Psychologists are stupefied by the human brain. And evolutionists are left with only one answer. There is no answer to the mind-body problem. If the difference between animals and human beings cannot be explained by physical means, we must look for a spiritual explanation. Most professing Christians would quickly agree there must be a spiritual aspect to the human condition. A biblical answer exists to the mind-body question. There is a spiritual component to mankind that elevates him above the physical. Zechariah 12 verse 1 states that the Lord forms the spirit of man within him. It clearly states that God created a spirit inside you. Proverbs 20 verse 27 sheds some light on its purpose for the spirit. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. God uses the spirit in man and woman as a way of interfacing with humanity. This is further expounded in the book of Job. There is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty gives them understanding. To put these two passages together, it clarifies that God uses the spirit in man to impart understanding. Through the spirit, God is able to teach physical man a degree of spiritual knowledge. However, he is spiritually incomplete. He needs another spirit. Man is a physical being with a spirit component. For centuries, mankind has experienced awesome progress and advancement, but at the same time continues to suffer ever worsening and appalling evils, troubles and ills. This is because man's problems are spiritual in nature. Great leaders have recognized the link between humanity's problems and the need for spiritual answers. General Douglas MacArthur, while attending the signing of Imperial Japan Surrender, September 2nd, 1945, which I thought was interesting when I was putting this sermon together. It was September 3rd when I was putting this sermon together. Here, September 2nd, 1945. General MacArthur, while attending the signing of Imperial Japan's surrender, said, Men since the beginning of time have sought peace. Military alliances, balances of power, leagues of nation, all in turn failed, leaving the only path to be by way of the crucible of war. The utter destructiveness of war now blots out this alternative. We have had our last chance. If we do not devise some greater and more equitable system, Armageddon will be at our door. The problem basically is theological and involves a spiritual recrudescence, an improvement of human character that will synchronize with our almost matchless advance in science, art, literature, and all material and cultural developments of the past 2,000 years. It must be of the spirit if we are to save the flesh. Over half a century has passed since General MacArthur uttered these words, yet problems worsen. Mankind is desperate for spiritual knowledge, a solution to his problems. He must turn to God to learn how to resolve his deep-rooted problems. Again, man is spiritually incomplete. He needs another spirit. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. God's Spirit, when combined with our spirit, enables us to know the things of God and to build holy, righteous character. The Spirit in man also records the events, experiences, and lessons in the life of each person and then returns to God when we die. Then shall the dust, man, return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return to God who gave it. God stores the vital ingredient of man until we are resurrected. The human spirit allows man to reason, analyze, and create. 
We're able to greatly exceed the capability of animals because of this special, unique, spiritual component. Again, I believe the Lord is saying to us today, mankind's problems are spiritual in nature. If we are just focusing on the physical, we will continue to come up short. Let us today continue to pray for the community and our world's spiritual well-being. For there, I believe, it lies the answer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We praise you for how you've made us in your image. Lord, we see that throughout the Bible. We are to be made and molded and fashioned into the image of your Son. Just like we talked about in Sunday school today. Lord, we need to walk in the light as you are in the light, to walk in the truth. Lord, how darkness seems to prevail, which creates fear and doubt and division, anger and hatred. Lord, we're made in your image to have fellowship with you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we can do that. We can go to you in our times of trouble, sadness, confusion. Lord, we can turn it all over to you. Turn our lives and our will over to the care of you who created us. Right now, Lord, I know there's people under the sound of my voice who are under hard, tough times. Lord, we call them to yourself each day, even early in the morning, Lord, will you wake them up and say, here I am, my child. Come to me. Lay down your burdens. I will give you rest. Lord, you provide the strength. Lord, you know us. You know all of our ins and outs, Lord, because you created us. You created us for that fellowship. Lord, will you call them to you? And Lord, will you rejuvenate them? Lord, will you continue to give them your energy and Strength, grace. Lord, we hold them close. Lord, we thank you that you are our all loving Father. You pour out that love into our hearts. Lord, you give us your spirit. Lord, you show us right here that each one of us are valuable. 